Good afternoon from beautiful Barcelona. I am Alexis Rod, CEO of SciTech Diplo Hub, the Barcelona Science and Technology Diplomacy Hub. Thank you so much for joining one more year at our SciTech Talks, a series of weekly free online lectures that SciTech Diplo Hub and eBay have put forward together with other world-class institutions and leading international experts in science diplomacy and global affairs. These three sessions taking place every Thursday will explore the role of climate diplomacy, the global governance and geopolitical indications of human genome editing, and how the Global South can leverage science diplomacy as a tool for social and economic progress. Today, we will address the future of climate action and environmental science diplomacy after the COVID pandemic. The current global health crisis has uh, probably put environmental cooperation on hold. As much as the impact of climate change is threatening communities here now, it feels uh, overtaken by the imminent danger of the COVID-19 pandemic. Some worry that the sense of urgency and the momentum built during the last years are doomed to disappear. The COVID-19 virus has led to localized improvements in air quality due to the reduction in economic activity from efforts to control the pandemic. But cuts in emissions as a result of the economic crisis will not uh, substitute for concerted climate action. In addition, climate change is a key determinant of transformations shaping modern society, including the location of population centers, the distribution of diseases, and the frequency and intensity of natural hazards such as uh, wildfires, floods, uh, and, and droughts. To support uh, joint climate action, in the last years we have witnessed uh, the development of epistemic communities such as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the, the IPCC, and transnational advocacy networks such as the Ocean and Climate Platform. In this way, uh, sustained interactions are maintained between scientists and policymakers so that these sectors can share ideas and better appreciate each other's practices. And science diplomacy has emerged as a significant vehicle for developing countries to influence international climate change negotiations. However, and there is still limited consideration on how to support diplomats, negotiators, and policymakers to bring climate change to the foreground in foreign policy and pursue effective international action beyond the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Aside from likely growing tensions with the US and the EU over its human rights record, China also has a lot of middle climate priorities with its biggest Western rivals, leaving room for cooperation and progress for the world's biggest emitters in the run-up to COP26 taking place this, this year in, in Scotland. But having said that, how will the pandemic impact our climate and our collective ability to tackle the climate emergency? What can we learn from the ongoing mitigation and response strategies to address climate change? What are the lessons learned for science diplomacy and how can stakeholders at international, regional and local level implement science diplomacy and environmental initiatives? What should be the next steps for governments, NGOs and the private sector in the aftermath of the pandemic to maintain momentum for climate action? To shed light on some of these issues, today we are delighted to welcome four world-class experts in sustainability, climate policy, and planetary health, who will be moderated by Mary van der Brise, Senior Researcher and Research Coordinator at the Sade Geo, Center for Global Economy and Geopolitics, and affiliated faculty at eBay, Institut Barcelona, de Estudios Internacionales. Mary, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Alexis. Thank you so much for this introduction and for the initiative. The floor is so, yours. Uh, then we'll go straight into it. You have um, posed some excellent and important questions, uh, particularly now, five to six months away from 20, uh, COP26 in, in Glasgow. Um, when COVID-19 hit, I think there were many questions that were raised about uh, climate change in multiple directions. Uh, there was the questions about the link between climate change and perhaps the cause of uh, epidemics uh, and pandemics of this sort, the link between nature and uh, human activity, questions about health and climate change. But it was also seen in the other direction. What is the impact going to be of uh, the of the COVID-19 pandemic on climate change? So we saw this short-term um, emissions drop, as you mentioned, but at the same time, we also saw a detrimental effect when it came to cooperation on climate change. We simply could not come together uh, to uh, see each other at COP26, no, uh, marking the five-year anniversary of the Paris Agreement. And there was a larger fear, I think, overall, that uh, the focus would go elsewhere, uh, that governments, um, uh, citizens would have larger concerns on their hands and that climate change would somehow fade into the background. And indeed, we have seen that emissions are rising again as our economic activity picks up, but 
At the same time, we have seen, um, in a, in a hopeful note, many announcements coming in over the past months on long-term climate goals uh, from some of the major states and smaller states. So uh, the question is, what direction are we heading in? What is the role here of politics, science, and diplomacy? And to bring this all together, um, it's really a pleasure to be moderating this session on, on these topics with an esteemed panel. So let me introduce them to you. Um, our first panelist is uh, Josep Maria Anto. He is professor of medicine at uh, Barcelona's Pompeo Fabra University, and he's a scientific director of the Barcelona Institute of Global Health, also known as ES Global. We have with us as well Camila Cepeda. She is the director general for global affairs at Mexico's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Mexico's lead climate negotiator. Our third panelist is Adrian Fung. He is the analyst in uh, climate diplomacy at the think tank and public policy consultancy at Delphi, focusing on climate development and foreign policies. And uh, last but not least, we have with us Mayana Lassen. She is uh, joining us from uh, the Netherlands, but she's associated uh, to a uh, center in Brazil. She's a senior associate researcher at the Earth System Science Center of the Brazilian Institute for Space Research. Um, so as you can see, we have uh, an excellent panel with a wide range of expertise, and I think we'll be able to touch on a wealth of topics today. So let's, let's launch straight right into this, and um, we'll start off with a round of individual questions for, for panelists, which I'll ask them to try to limit their answers. I know it will be difficult to uh, five to, to seven minutes. We'll then do a round, a collective question for all, and finally, we'll be taking questions from the audience. And so to our viewers, um, please do post your questions. We'll be very happy to bring those in. So again, uh, panelists, welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, let us start with uh, Adrian Fung. Um, Adrian, you are an analyst in climate diplomacy, and so your work spans the intersection of climate development and foreign policies. My question to you is, and this is a question that I think is going to be popping up onto the radar ever more, is how can foreign action evolve to address climate-related fragility and security risks? And relatedly, how can we strengthen the links between actors in development, diplomacy on, and defense on the one hand, and climate scientists and innovators on the other? Floor is yours. Yeah, so first of all, thanks for the invitation. And also, it's a pleasure to be with such a distinguished panel of experts to discuss this really important and very timely issues. So I'll try to break up these questions into parts. So to start off with, I think it's worth pointing out, and I'm sure a lot of you are, may have already heard that climate change has often been described as a threat multiplier, in that its impacts, such as droughts and floods, a compound existing conditions such as a high dependence maybe on uh, sustainable forms of agriculture or it could compound situations of fragility such as uh, underlying political grievances or social inequalities so basically these climate change impacts uh, exacerbating these risks and increasing these risks to extent that they escalate into instability conflict and violence and also just to uh, bring the focus back onto the pandemic itself. So like the virus, climate change knows no borders. It goes beyond geopolitical boundaries. It uh, transcends generations. So the problems are diverse. Uh, and it's not just linked to security and to conflict and violence, but also on other aspects such as food security and obviously on health, on social inequalities and so on. So because the impacts are diverse, Similarly, the solutions and the responses themselves need to take into account all these uh, many factors. And uh, therefore, they need to be comprehensive, holistic, they need to be multi-sectoral, and uh, very importantly, multilateral in their approach. So this is where foreign policy or foreign action comes in, because foreign policy actors are in a unique position to basically bring all these different stakeholders, uh, decision makers from different backgrounds, sectors, ministries, different countries, uh, from different levels of governance to work together to solve this common issue. So that's sort of the underlying foundation from which um, foreign policy is uniquely positioned to, ad to address these risks. And from this perspective, uh, foreign policy has a really important role to also manage the trade-offs that could happen uh, 
uh, when implementing these policies and strategies. For example, if there's a policy that's meant to increase climate ad adaptation and resilience, or to support the transition to its greener economies through uh, pushing more renewables, for example, or for policies that or strategies that uh, aim to provide humanitarian assistance or development aid, what foreign policy does is to essentially make sure that these uh, climate actions, for example, are conflict sensitive, whereas on the other hand, uh, policies and initiatives related to development or on humanitarian aid or conflict prevention and peace building are themselves climate resilient. So that's that's where foreign policy or foreign action stands is to really make sure that these are both climate and conflict sensitive, so to speak. And now one very good example of how foreign action can help to address climate security risks is none other than the United Nations, the UN, uh, specifically looking at the Security Council, which of course being the only uh, UN body that uh, whose resolutions are legally blind, uh, binding, is in a unique position to, an, to make sure that the climate change agenda is brought up higher in the security agenda. So currently the climate, uh, so current climate security itself uh, doesn't fall into any one single UN body or system. Although there are conventions and agreements, of course, such as the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement that have made significant progress in achieving this uh, climate change agenda higher up in the UN system. Uh, but with regards to climate security risks, there is not, well, this is where the Security Council has a very important role to play because the Security Council is itself mandated by the UN to maintain international peace and security. And in the past decade or so, we have actually seen the Security Council increasingly discuss climate change in their recent open debates and resolutions. And from these debates and meetings, we've seen several developments that are stepping into this uh, direction in bringing climate security higher up in the agenda or in the priority list, uh, such as the Group of Friends, for example, in 2018, that aims to enhance cooperation in developing solutions to address climate security risks among member states, to raise public awareness of the issue and to bring the issue higher up in the agenda. Um, there's also the uh, climate security mechanism, which aims to build a more comprehensive UN response to address these risks. So basically foreign policy through these many multilateral frameworks and institutions has a very important role to play in ensuring that the responses to address climate security risks are comprehensive, they're inclusive, and that they bring all countries and actors on board uh, to tackle this common issue together. But um, at the moment, these, there's still a sort of disconnect, you could say, between these different actors uh, that are involved in, for example, in development aid on one side, who are sometimes not really speaking to those who are working in the security or environment fields. And this has not only been happening at the ministerial or governmental level, uh, but also at the operational levels, uh, such as within or between civil society groups. So there is a need to go beyond these so-called silos to get these actors involved together to formulate policies that are more comprehensive, that take into account different voices, uh, different experiences and skill sets, so that these policies and strategies become more effective. And as I mentioned as, uh, before, to potentially manage these trade-off effects. Um, so the time frame is also another important factor to consider to to build this link uh, between these different uh, actors, specifically between science and policy making. Uh, because some may say that climate science tends to look at the long-term consequences of climate change, whereas for those in the political decision-making fields, they tend to look at it in a more short-term basis, especially when it's more relevant for their usually shorter political cycles. So, to bridge this gap, science does also need to provide a more short and medium term time frames for their work and for their analysis to basically align with those uh, interests of the decision makers to enable them to implement basically more rapid and more uh, effective solutions. Okay. 
Thank you so much for this, Adrian. I think that was a really comprehensive uh, answer on some of the challenges that are still outstanding on this field. So thanks for that. Um, I'd like to move on to uh, Josep Marianto, and it's also about the connection between policy areas to some extent. Um, so my question is um, about uh, the connection between health and environment, right, which is clearly something that the recent pandemic has reminded us of. And you have been leading the Planetary Health Initiative at ES Global and at the UPF, and you've been driving awareness about uh, this concept internationally. So I'd like to ask about this planetary health, uh, how this approach can help us to better address urgent environmental issues, um, including related food systems or even actually uh, microbial resistance. And also if you could give us a few examples of, of projects that are currently working in this direction. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in this uh, very interesting session with this uh, very attractive panel of speakers. Thanks a lot to the site at Diplohub and eBay for the arranging the this series of meetings and the invitation to talk about uh, about the planetary health. And as you said, Marie, it's uh, uh, this issue of environment and health. I, I for most of my uh, research and, and uh, academic career, I have been working working on the relationship between human health and environment and teaching about air pollution and, and impact of environment, other type of environmental factors. And I think it was in 2015 when I was uh, reading a report in the Lancet from a Rockefeller Lancet Commission on planetary health that I suddenly changed my way of thinking about environment and health. And this is because probably mainly because four different type of reasons uh, related to the report. The, the first one, it was because it uh, proposed a radical change in the definition of health. Uh, in, in medicine and in public health, we are still working with the definition of health that was established by WHO more than 50 years ago. And in this report, uh, with the concept of planetary health, it was the proposal of incorporating the health of the planet to the definition of the human health. So in a way, internalizing the health of the planet for the human health and accepting that it will not be health for humans without the health of the planet. And this is a quite a radical uh, conceptual change. Uh, this is not uh, unique for planetary health. It's similar to other similar uh, evolving concepts like One Health or Eco Health. But uh, I understood at that time that the way I was seeing environment and health, it was unidirectional. It was, we were concerned with environment being harmful for human health. Now with the new concept of planetary health, it was the opportunity to see the relationship be directional. It's not only about how environment affects our human health, but also how our human health affects an environment. And then this gives the opportunity to think um, about planetary health in a very simple way, which is which things are good for the human health or bad for the human health, and in which respect they are good or bad for the health of the planet. And you can put this concept in a very simple two by two table. And then if you take some of the, the issues that you mentioned in your question, like uh, food uh, security or, uh, I mean, healthy nutrition or antimicrobial resistance, well, you can see that for, uh, for food, there is a big opportunity to make it good for human health and good for the planet. Well, and this is an issue that it's uh, growing research and solutions there is a, a, a very uh, good scientific understanding of the problems of under and over nutrition that we have. And in some cases, the, sol the solution are very clear in supporting both human health and the planet. And, and the more probably popular example is reducing the consumption of uh, red meat in the, uh, uh, in the more affluent countries, where there is a clearly excessive consumption of red meat. Red meat is a well-established causal uh, factor for uh, several types of cancer. And at the same time, this is one of the main drivers in the food sector 
for uh, greenhouse emissions. So this is a very good example. We're introducing sustainable uh, diets. You can do good for health and good human health and good for the planet. And the antimicrobial resistance, in a way, it's a, it's a different type. Uh, and it's something that it's antibiotics clearly good for humans. And we have seen clearly uh, happening with the pandemic. So uh, antibiotics and other drugs are good for humans. But at the same time, they are bad for the planet. They are contributors to emission. They produce residues. They, uh, they affect biodiversity. So in this case, again, you can see planetary health providing you a very good view of uh, how to tackle antimicrobial resistance. Uh, to some extent, this is similar to the, to the overall health systems. We know our, our health systems in, uh, in the more affluent countries are uh, probably responsible for 5 to 10% of national emissions. I mean, UK, Australia, US, uh, we, are, we, we are having increasing evidence of that. Uh, health systems are good for human health. We need to strengthen them, but we need to make them good for the planet. So we need to decarbonize health systems rapidly in the coming years. And this is, again, a strategy that is going on. Well, these are the type of applications of planetary health that made me to change my understanding of the relationship between uh, human health. When the, when the um, COVID came into, uh, then we rapidly realized that probably COVID was a kind of anthropocene disease. And this is because the way that COVID represents the interlink between processes that are affecting the natural systems, processes that are very global, and processes that are interlinking social, economic, and human health. And in this way, we and others have been providing uh, arguments to understand COVID as a disease of the Anthropocene. Well, in the last days, we have seen uh, growing evidence that we should not reject uh, rapid, immediately the possibility of an accident in the Wuhan lab. Uh, well, this is uh, something that we will need to see in the future. But nevertheless, it, COVID has helped us to understand the importance of a spillover, whatever for COVID or for other pandemics, and to which extent these spillovers relate to our relationships with nature and the pandemic. So this is how I see planetary health in, in this context. Uh, just to, to finish, um, you, you were asking me about uh, uh, one minute about the type of projects. So probably one of the projects I am more exciting is the what we call the Planetary Wellbeing Initiative in the Pompeo Fabra University. We have created a task force from all disciplines in the university uh, working together on these issues. We have recently published a paper in a journal, Sustainability, uh, describing the experience of this Planetary Wellbeing uh, Initiative. One of the, the ambitions that we have is to transform research and teaching in the university uh, in a way that it's more directly and more ambitiously tackling uh, the challenges that we have in this context. Uh, and, and for instance, one of the materializations of this uh, type of initiative is a, a new master on planetary health that has been very recently approved by the official academic authority in Spain. Uh, and it's a, a multi-university, it's a, with Open University, uh, UPF and ES Global, and it's probably one of the first type of this type of degrees in, in the world. Uh, and, and we are very excited moving forward with this type of initiatives. Thank you so much for uh, both the framework and the very concrete implementation of that on every level. So, so thanks very much for this. Uh, extremely interesting. Um, let's move now uh, to uh, Latin America. Uh, and particularly, um, we'd like to speak with uh, Miana uh, Lassen, Lansen, sorry, about um, kind of two particular aspects. So I know that you've worked extensively on, on climate politics uh, in, in the United States and Brazil. And um, my question kind of goes in, in two parts. The first is um, regarding climate denial. Uh, and the question is, what can we learn from the climate denial defended by uh, President Jair Bolsonaro and Donald Trump? 
And the second part is, uh, is related more to the science uh, policy uh, side of things. And it's about how uh, Brazil can strengthen its science policy interface to advance uh, climate mitigation. And if we want to be a little bit more concrete, uh, we could bring up, for example, the issue of the Amazon um, to understand why it is so critically important in international climate politics and what might be done in the run up to COP26 to ensure its protection. Diana, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and hearing these interesting uh, knowledge is being shared. Um, so to answer first about the denial, it's something I care a lot about. Uh, I'm a cultural anthropologist, so I'm very, and I've been studying knowledge politics for a long time. And I started out in the US and um, later have studied it in Brazil. And I think what really comes through is, you know, if we took, we look at the phenomenon of Donald Trump and uh, Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil is understand um, well, that facts do not trump beliefs. And it's actually science-based. We know from cognitive scientists that how important our beliefs are, that we actually fit facts to our beliefs much more than is generally recognized in society. So we still, we love to look and say, people need to get the science. But the fact is that how it actually works in society is that the beliefs are extremely important. So we can at one level what we need to learn is to kind of protect ourselves from that uh, tendency to just let beliefs um, overshadow the science because it is so important that we are science-based um, and so there we're talking about what kind of institutions that so we really need strong institutions that are protecting science so you can have something like really strong science technology assessment bodies that need to be very, very protected from politics. And so that kind of protection of institutions in government against political pressure, so against lobbies, et cetera, is a very, very important way to institutionalize this kind of safety against beliefs, uh, overcrowding, really, really important signs. And that's really what we've learned in COVID. And everyone is saying now the COVID, hopefully we've learned the lesson that the science is so important. Um, and I think that is so important. Um, but I also worry a little bit about how we're talking about it in this context of COVID, because there is this tendency to say, now the science is all, it's been legitimized and it's stronger. But there's also a danger of putting too much faith on the science um, that we need to also, you know, and, and so the previous speaker spoke about that we're, now there's this lab leak possibility coming out and there's been a suppression of that actually in, in our, so we have to be careful um, that we um, that we do not suppress things as well in our sort of ideological sort of reactions. So, so the first step is, okay, strong institutions, we protect ourselves against this kind of political influence on the beliefs. But the other one is also to understand, okay, let's actually learn from that lesson. So if we realize, we've seen now that facts trump beliefs, and what there's been so much less attention to in climate science and in diplomacy and in how we even talk about effecting change, is the importance of really attending to how do we believe, how do people, public societies come to think and believe what they think in the first place. Um, so we, you know, so there's been this crowding out of the social science um, and even humanities in favor of a very natural science, like let's get the facts straight. Um, but we've seen this for decades now, these, you know, the IPCC um, uh, assessments, and they keep coming back to very similar conclusions, actually, just more shrill saying and, and this assumption that if they just keep producing these assessments, there will be the kind of change that we need in society. And that's not happened. So if we really take more seriously this idea about facts do not trump beliefs, then we have to look more at the belief part of, of uh, the whole equation. And that can bring in a whole new set of questions that will make us look at, and we should look at much more critically about information environments. How do people come to believe what they believe in the first place? Um, and, you know, there you have, you know, it's very, um, well, among the things we have to be very attentive to is this surveillance capitalism as um, uh, Shoshana, Bull, um, I forget, uh, 
get her name right in the moment, but from Harvard, she has just, she has this notion of surveillance capitalism. It's about the big tech companies and how they are, you know, through um, through Cambridge Analytica, you know, Cambridge Analytica type strategies and exactly precisely that company has been behind uh, the phenomenon of Bolsonaro and of Trump coming out. And so in the context of the US uh, so the rebellion on the Capitol, uh, she had a piece in, the, in an op-ed in the New York Times in which she said, we cannot have surveillance capitalism. So these big tech companies that use our private data and then they sell it to the biggest bidder so that those who buy it can shape societal outcomes because they know how to micro target messages through the social media um, and then shape outcomes and all these elections that we know that there have been interferences in so thinking at that level you know so what we've seen the huge you know spike in emissions in brazil um and this now very sort of, uh, you know going towards a more uh, authoritarian society uh, that is really at root about how we control these big interests, these big companies, and the use of information. So my point is here, we need to think much more critically about the information environments. You know, we know, we've long known, everyone kind of knows that mass media are really important, but we do not really bring that in. Um, to, so we should bring that focus into what we even talk about in terms of research you know, and science um, and policies. So that is kind of, so that gets to your second question about the science policy interface, which is something that is very, very much missing, for example, in Brazil, um, where you have a very, very strong and very um, prestigious uh, science community, and I'm part of it. I'm, in a very natural science dominated sort of group where they do climate models, et cetera. And that's what we've been doing for decades. But we need to bring in so I think we're having some technical issues. Uh, Mayana, I'm not sure whether you can hear us. Um, perhaps we'll pause for a moment and move on to the next speaker while the technical side of things sorts out. That's the pleasure of, of, of course, the online environment. I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll, be, we'll manage to reconnect in just a moment. So let me uh, move here to um, our uh, final speaker, whom we're so happy to have with us as well, uh, Camila Cepeda. Um, I'd like to ask you uh, precisely about, uh, I suppose, uh, something that Mayana was just touching upon. Um, and so my question is, Mexico has recently called for a comprehensive and cross-border logic in addressing the major environmental problems affecting the international community. Um, what, approach, what approach is Mexico following to integrate climate action and science diplomacy in its international relations? The floor is yours. Thank you, Marie. And it was a shame that we lost Mayana in the middle. I was very interested uh, what what she was talking about. I mean, I'm sure we'll we'll get her back in a minute. And uh, yes, um, and as, as as she was also mentioning about uh, facts and, and beliefs. Um, the thing is that in the climate regime, uh, science has always been at the heart of its construction. Um, and uh, we're we're very happy to say that uh, since its inception. Um, we've had the um, International Panel on Climate Change, um, the IPCC, uh, which, uh, as you may recall, um, in, in 1988 was created uh, before even the convention, uh, the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change. Um, so, so science has been at, at the beginning of the construction of of all this environmental uh, regime. And um, we are uh, very fortunate in Mexico that uh, we have an Institute of Ecology and Climate Change, which actively uh, contributes to the IPCC. And, uh, we, we, and we also, uh, beyond uh, participating, we have ensured that our national policy is aligned with those scientific findings in order uh, to create just and, and climate ambitious policies. And, and uh, one thing that, that uh, I wanted to, to mention is that currently um, within this new context of not only a climate crisis, but uh, a COVID-19 pandemic, 
and uh, within this uh, emergency, it has exposed um, all the fragility and nauseousness of our current lifestyle. And that uh, it just not only endangers, endangers human life, but it definitely poses a vital threat to the well-being of our planet. And we cannot ignore anymore uh, those facts, and, and we can't uh, just guide us for, for beliefs, and we need that science to back um, what what we are now uh, deciding on on our construction of, of a new uh, a new normality and and definitely uh, keeping to the usual business is not the way forward. I mean, we have now an opportunity. Uh, we've been hearing all the of the political um, discussion on on building back better, on ensuring a green and resilient recovery, and so on. So we have this opportunity uh, right now and that we are in the middle of uh, negotiations, uh, both in the biodiversity front and in the climate uh, change uh, front. And this uh, pandemic um, has unfortunately delayed for a whole year that process, which is urgent given the, the situation. Um, and uh, within that year, uh, we have learned a lot, uh, a lot of experience. and. Um, at least from, from our side, from Mexico, we have been very vocal uh, in the sense that we need to engage again in this uh, virtual negotiations, even if we can't be in, in person. And on the contrary, we see it um, as a great opportunity because we have found ourselves um, now in, in, uh, in a city scenario where we can meet and engage in, in ways that we had never imagined before. This, this example of, of this panel is a great uh, showcase that we have so many talents from so many different uh, sectors and countries and we can engage in fruitful discussions and so on. Uh, we, we need to do that also for uh, formal negotiations. I mean, we have so many pending urgent matters and virtual settings actually have been very productive and we've uh, figured out that now we can even be more inclusive than than before and engage uh, with more stakeholders uh, and than uh, we we previously had and for for all of this uh, climate talks that we say i mean the carbon footprint of our negotiator is ridiculous no we've been traveling uh, around the globe for so many decades and contributing to that, that same uh, carbon footprint that we are criticizing. And now uh, the virtual platforms allow us um, to discuss uh, and to engage without even the budgetary restrictions for paying for all of those search travel expenses. And um, in, in the case of Mexico, we have taken advantage of that whole year and uh, we have been able to organize broad consultations with different actors uh, beyond usual suspects. Normally, uh, Mexico is a very centralized uh, country, so we would uh, pretty much just only hear from very well organized civil society within Mexico City. Um, and now uh, we have been able to hear from, for example, young people from uh, southern states, from the part of the con north part of the country, and, uh, um, and not only from, from young people, but from um, other members of the community that maybe are not, not, are not part of, of uh, civil society as such, but that they are activists and that they um, now with uh, the social media are very engaged with the, the discussions that are happening uh, currently. And even on a, on a larger scale uh, at the international level, for example, um, we uh, were fortunate enough that uh, with Canada within uh, um, our nature solutions, uh, nature based solutions action track that we were planning for for the adaptation summit, we came up with the idea of having a indigenous people's dialogue on climate change, biodiversity, and desertification. And because of this virtual setting, we were able to have uh, representatives from indigenous peoples from all over the globe, and uh, we we had the opportunity to hear their concerns, their perspectives. And uh, we, we took upon ourselves to have a summary of all of these key messages and bring them to the three real conventions and push uh, for, for those ideas and have their voices uh, heard. So uh, this virtuality also gives us this, this kind of opportunities. And 
also work in synergies. Adrian was mentioning uh, that we have to stop working in silos. Well, this, this virtuality has also allowed us um, to push within the three real conventions and work in an integrated manner, in a coherent manner, and be uh, very adamant uh, for this purpose uh, alongside the, the road. And as we are now currently in the middle of uh, negotiations within the subsidiary bodies of the Convention on Biological Diversity, and next week for the UNFCCC, um, we have been able to integrate our largest technical Mexican delegation ever to date. Uh, because uh, usually what the people who are, go to these meetings are um, us who, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, our embassies, our missions, diplomats, uh, political people, uh, but the technical, the experts, the scientists usually don't make the cut uh, because they don't have the budgetary expenses to do so. And now we have been able to in integrate, as I was saying, a very large delegation with our specialists in each of the uh, outstanding issues that will be discussed to support us uh, diplomats and negotiators uh, to have that science behind what we will be uh, pushing for. Mm. So, for yeah. a year and a half of, of uh, this experience, I mean, we've, we've learned a lot and uh, we do believe that uh, virtuality is a way forward and that we can advance negotiations in a more transparent way. Um, I mean, we do hear a lot of reluctances from some countries or some parties um, that uh, they don't want to take any formal decisions. Um, and, and they use uh, the, res the, the reason that the, it's not an inclusive process and that there are connection restrictions. And yes, there are, but we can overcome it. And um, personally, I believe that it's just excuses to delay the process. So, I mean, there's a, a future for, for climate negotiations after COVID. And I think that the virtual set has, has proved us that it's a, an extremely useful way. Thank well, you. Okay. Oh, Thanks so much for this, uh, Camila. I think that was a great link uh, between kind of the three topics that we have uh, probably prominently uh, in, in the webinar, no? The, uh, uh, the pandemic, climate diplomacy, science diplomacy. That's really wonderful to hear uh, from the field that these initiatives are ongoing, the linkage between the areas as well. Um, so I see also that we have uh, Mayana back with us, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that you were able to connect as well. Um, I'd like to now just pose a very quick question. Um, and by that, I mean, I would like uh, to ask our panelists if they could be extremely short in their answers. Mayanne, if you'd like to take a little bit more time to, to finish up the point you were making, you're welcome to do that, of course. Um, and it actually links to a question that we've also seen coming in from one of our viewers, Toto Mas uh, Matsebiso. Um, the question is, what are the prospects for the future of science diplomacy for climate action? And how can evolving partnerships and initiatives be scaled to sustain momentum? I know that's an important and a difficult question, but still I would like to ask our panelists um, to uh, give us short answers if they can. So Mayana, would you like to start? Yes, sorry, I'm happy to be back. Sorry, these things happen. Um, well, I, yeah, I was in the middle of just saying, and it speaks very much to the point your question now, um, you know that we have to think uh, much more about what kind of knowledge is on the on you know that dominates in these science um, discussions, so that we think more about bringing in uh, critical cr well, critical perspectives and actually you know a a creating a space for talking about politics and the media. So, for example, there was a point made about meat, um, and that's something, for example, in Brazil that we can't really talk about. So, if it's about the mitigation. Um, but in the media, they will not talk critically about meat as a problem. Um, and there are many reasons for that. And, you know, one needs to be sensitive to the interests, et cetera, that are there. But it's a very good example of how a country is not served well if there is not um, a very good, a, a strong institution where the media are actually like a fourth, you know, sort of um, the fourth estate, right? That 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 brings something that needs to, have to be independent, so it can foster public debate. Um, so I think that really speaks to what it is that we need: is that kind of rethinking of what we even think about is the knowledge that we need, and what are the discussions that we need, um, so that we're sure that we bring in all of the topics. And one example, just being also there was, you know, I was talking about the 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 lap leak versus is this a zoonotic, the zoonotic, um, so coming, you know, 
a disease coming from, from animals. And there's been a muffling of the media in the US and internationally because we didn't want to seem like we were supporting the racism um, that like the Trump uh, administration was putting out about this is, you know, the Chinese uh, virus, but actually it was limiting what we would even explore. And it's really important that we also under attend to the lab leak uh, possibility because that points to other dangers. So, you know, we can care about climate mitigation, but we also really need to avoid future epidemics. And so if pandemics, and so if this really is a, a result of what is called gain in function research that might have been supported actually you know, by the US uh, NIH, um, that we need to know that so that there'll be more public oversight. So the one thing and message I want to leave in all of this is the importance of public oversight. But we need to understand that publics have to be very well informed and they're not sufficiently supported in current political and institutional environments to really have the best information and robust information um, and knowing where to get that. So that's what I will end on. No, thank you. Thank you for that, Mayana. Very important point. Um, so let's uh, turn it over to uh, Joseph Maria Anto for, for a quick response to the question about the prospects for the future of science diplomacy for climate action. Thank you, Maria. I, I would say that, uh, well, I have started to learn about science diplomacy while preparing this meeting, so it's, uh, you should apologize for my ignorance. But I, what I can see, for instance, we are in an urgent need of developing a new type of multidisciplinary partnerships. This is key to who we tackle uh, climate challenges and, and its relationship with health. Uh, well, planetary health or One Health are this type of new partnerships, totally different from the traditional scientific forms. Uh, it has a lot to do with uh, international cooperation. Uh, and here I clearly see uh, and a role for uh, for scientific diplomacy. Probably this is one of the examples of what I think you call uh, uh, diplomacy for science. Okay. Um, on the other hand, well, something that the COVID has uh, uh, put uh, more than ever in the agenda is the need to probably review and strengthen WHO and the global governance of health. And there is plenty of scientific evidence supporting the need for these uh, uh, changes. Uh, uh, and here, probably, this is a very good example of uh, um, diplomacy, uh, science for diplomacy. Okay, So I think we, as a scientist, see the urgent need of reforming these structures. And here, uh, scientific diplomacy has a big role to play. Uh, let me, just to finish on this regard, uh, uh, making a comment about uh, uh, the, the declaration of the Nobel, the call for action indeed, that was uh, released uh, uh, at the end of April by after the summit of the Nobel Prize Organization uh, for uh, our, uh, our future, our, our planet. Uh, and the declaration, the call for action, and that with the concept that I think it's fundamental, that it's planetary stewardship and, and the need to be effective on this planetary uh, stewardship in the coming years. And here again, I see a big role for science diplomacy. Thanks. Uh, three really great points, I think. Perhaps it's a new concept, but I, I, I certainly uh, saw a lot of excellent uh, contributions there. So thanks so much for that. Adrian, would you like to contribute to, to this? Yes, sure. Thanks, Marie. Well, I think a short answer to the question on the prospects of the future of science diplomacy is, well, it's looking bright at the moment. And I say that for many reasons. Um, I think if we look at the political level, uh, like look at the ministerial level, we see there's a lot of interest growing uh, among governments to take climate change seriously, uh, especially the security risks of climate change, as I've mentioned, uh, through the UN Security Council. But also more recently, uh, with the U.S. back into the climate field, uh, when, with uh, President Biden announcing that the U.S. is going to ramp up their uh, climate ambitions in the recent climate summit, uh, I think it was last month, uh, we see there's this uh, reinvigoration for multilateral cooperation on the climate sphere. 
So I think uh, with these political trends, uh, the prospects for science diplomacy is looking good, at least for the moment. But if we look down to the grassroots, I think the momentum is also building, especially when we consider the youth movements that are calling for climate justice that's happening all over the world. Uh, this is also a very positive trend. So I know there's a lot of um, concern that the pandemic that we're in right now is causing a dent or is pausing a lot of these activities that has been building up for climate action. But I think if we look in the long run, um, this momentum will continue to build up and the pandemic will come and go, but uh, the climate action is something that will continue to, to build on in the future. Mm -hmm. An important conclusion, I think, uh, from this year. Uh, Camille, I know that you already touched on this uh, to some extent in your intervention, but would you like to provide a short reaction to that uh, overarching question? Yes, and yes, we do believe that science diplomacy is, is a powerful tool uh, to product, provide uh, not just only valuable minimum information, but to boost participation of society in decision-making processes. I mean, I will informed, critical and committed societies, one that demands stronger and more decisive environmental policies from, from their governments. And just wanted to, to mention a great example, which is the Escazú Agreement that just entered into force in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, which is the first ever international treaty um, that uh, regards human, uh, human person defenders on, on the environment and it grants access to information, public participation, and access to justice in the region in environmental matters. Thanks for this um, concrete example and for a, a quick reaction as well. Um, we only have, we don't have too much time left, but I would like to, to bring in a question here from, from our audience. We do have some good ones coming in. Um, and so we have a question from, um, I imagine that the correct pronunciation is João Paulo Freitas. And his question is on the SDGs. Um, he's asking whether the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are sufficient or desirable common language to advance this uh, environmental science diplomacy that we've been talking about. Uh, so to what extent uh, does that framework help us with, with what we're discussing today? Um, who would like to, to take this question? I'm seeing, uh, Camilla, would you like to? Yes, I know that you work on this as well, uh, correct? Yes, yes, it's part of my portfolio. So um, definitely the 23rd agenda has been a roadmap for uh, our countries. I mean, it's extremely hard that 196 countries got together and agreed on these ideals. So we have made sure that on every negotiation front, on every topic, we bring the 2030 agenda. And I mean, each country has their sovereignty to, to have their institutional um, and legal parameters to, to fulfill it. Um, and we have been called that it's the decade of action. We're very far away, even more with the pandemic, in fulfilling our SDGs. But it's definitely a, a very useful language uh, because we have now all agreed to it. So whenever someone uh, derails from that, we can always return and say, like, you have already within the UN framework um, uh, agreed to this uh, to this objective. So we we must now fulfill them. So it, it is a very useful. Okay. Thanks uh, so much, Camilla. Um, uh, we had committed to keeping the webinar uh, to uh, a good uh, amount of time for these kind of online formats. And so I'm happy to say that a number of the questions that we came in, that came in by the audience, I think we've been able to answer them also through our, through our discussions. So I hope we were able to, uh, to provide those answers. So with that, I'll just um, take the opportunity to thank you so much for your excellent contributions. I feel like we could be speaking for a full day still, but that would not be appropriate for an online format. Uh, and so with that, I'll just thank you and I'll turn it over to Alexis. Thank you so much, uh, Marie, for this outstanding moderation. And thanks so much, Camila, Adrian, Mariana, and Jose Maria for this enlightening discussion today. As we saw, as in the same way that some of our speakers today were highlighting, better addressing the climate crisis will require stronger and richer bonds between academia, policymakers, the civil society, international organizations, and the private sector to improve data collections, climate resilience assessments, or even early warnings, uh, warnings of, of systemic risks. COVID-19 will pass in time, but our societies will have changed. Our governance structures, our science advisory mechanisms, and our diplomatic tools need to change alongside them. 
The world needs to demonstrate the same unity and commitment to climate action and cutting greenhouse gas emissions as to containing the coronavirus pandemic as we saw for the last uh, one and a half years. Failure in this, failure in climate change mitigation could lead to greater human life and economic losses during the coming decades. And it is becoming, becoming more and, and more obvious that this is a time for more science diplomacy. I would like also to take this opportunity to remind you that applications for our Science Diplomacy Summer School are now open. This unique two weeks university course to be held this July in an online format and organized by SciTech Diplohub and eBay together with other leading institutions will allow you to get certified in science diplomacy and further into some of the topics we have been discussing today as well as other pressing issues at the intersection of science and diplomacy including cybersecurity, AI and tech diplomacy, sustainable development, global health and the role of global cities and emerging economies in this issue. Thank you very much for tuning in today and please join us next Thursday at the same time to discuss on the global governance of human genome entity. If you haven't done it yet, don't forget to register. Thank you so much. Stay safe and see you next week.